Thanks very much to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Shaw. We have several questions that have come up in the Q&A poll over the course of the, of the webinar. Uh, it's great to see. What I'll do is I'll go through these questions and I might go back and forth a little bit between questions that came during Dr. Anderson's and then questions that came during Dr. Shaw's, if that's okay. Some of the questions, uh, given some of the similarities between the two systems, or three systems, uh, some of the questions uh, I'm gonna direct to both of you as well. So the first question uh, is for, for Dr. Anderson. Regarding electrostatic precipitation for odor control, are there any concerns um, with spontaneous combustion and fires? During the course of our research, when the system was operating normally, we didn't see any. I mentioned I sh and showed the picture of the plywood tunnel that we built, and at first it seemed to work just fine. I did mention that at some point we did take it down, and one of the things we saw at that point was some arcing from the uh, ionization wire to the plywood. So when it was operating normally, right, without that box, it didn't seem to have any concern. When it was there, though, yes, it definitely gave us a little concern, and that was one of the reasons we removed it. But I think that was more an artifact of how we were trying to measure than the actual system. Right. Okay. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, when you were showing the uh, the odor reduction with and without the electrostatic component of the system on, uh, was uh, there was different odor uh, measurements between B and A, for example, or when was there odor stronger at different times of the year, at different times of the sampling? Uh, was there more manure in the pit or yeah. were there smaller differences? Yeah, so we started with two new barns in this case. So as the manure level increased, we also tended to increase ventilation because we started early in the spring. And I think what you saw there is actually uh, the spring in Iowa was really fun, like normal, right? You get a beautiful week and then a cold week. And I happened to randomly pick weeks that I had the fence on where it was relatively cold. We still had small pigs and the ventilation rates were pretty small in that barn. So one of the things, right, we focused all our measurements on one fan that should always be running. But as some of those other tunnel fans kicked on, they'd get a lot more ventilation in that system and just a lot more dilution air moving through the barn. So you'd expect some lower odor. And I just happened to randomly, uh, especially early in the spring, and then again later in the fall, have bad weeks that fell when the fence was on that, that caused greater odor in the barn, I think is what you're seeing there, more than a manure effect. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shaw, with the dust collection on the, on the, in on the interior of the, of the system you described, are there concerns with combustible dust? during the course of that removal process? Uh, I cannot see any reason why we would have uh, so much of dust collection to cause uh, combustion related issues. You can also have that kind of dust collection on uh, your shutters. Mm -hmm. And shutters are plastic and the mosquito screen is fiberglass. So I, I don't think there's a concern with that. Uh, obviously there are no fire sources around there and fiberglass uh, I don't think uh, combusts easily. The other, another question for you, Dr. Shaw, um, with the vegetation that's on the, on the outside of this windbreak wall that you described, there's a comment about uh, vegetation must be kept short near, la near laying hen houses. And so does the growth of this grass outside of this system, uh, did that raise any concerns, especially on the poultry systems where you were working? What happened on the, that, that's an excellent question, uh, but what happened on the poultry system was we got kicked out of one house because that ha house had to be depopulated. We had finally been able to get to that house because commercial houses turned us down. So we didn't have the time to really spread out a lot of um, switchgrass. So the switchgrass didn't grow as much as we would have liked to see them grow. Uh, but I would expect that um, switchgrass wouldn't grow as well inside where you don't have as much sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that, but at the same time, I will also admit that we did see some switchgrass of the Shenandoah cultivar creep inside and grow, but they did not grow in front of the minimum ventilation fan, which probably had to do with the higher pollutant loadings that affected uh, soil electrical conductivity or something like that. I'm not sure about that, but it didn't grow in front of the minimum ventilation fans. So I would, I would not expect that to be a major problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson, maybe a point of clarification. A question came up during your presentation about the type of facility that you were um, using with the electrostatic precipitation wall as well as the scrubber system. 
was it a broiler or layer facility or, or something else? Yeah, so both of those would be uh, swine finishing buildings, right? And uh, at the uh, tunnel ventilated barn where we had the electrostatic fence, uh, it's a deep pit manure storage uh, tunnel ventilated barn and it was a 1200 head uh, finishing facility. Uh, the wet scrubber system was a double wide swine finishing barn again with a deep pit. Uh, so a 2400 head barn, but there was a wet scrubber on each side. So that barn was divided in the middle with a solid wall. Uh, pit div division wall as well, so separate ventilation systems for both of those. But they're both swine finishing buildings with uh, liquid manure storage systems. And one of the questions that came up, uh, worded a little bit differently, um, with, the, with the wastewater from the scrubbing system, for example, being added to the, to the overall manure um, storage area and then land applied, does that have any implications for permits or, um, or other regulatory implications? Well, when we were just using water in our facility, certainly it didn't change what we were doing as all, at all, other than the fact that uh, they were a little hesitant to change out water too frequently because we needed to make sure we'd have enough storage to make it to our next application window. So at times we probably all agreed that the water should have been changed out, but uh, we were a little full in the manure storage and didn't have a place to go with it. So we, we had to live with the water we had, uh, but with just water, we didn't have to worry about any uh, extra regulatory issues. Certainly if you would think about acids and how you might store some of that acid, high acid wash water, putting it in your manure storage may add some challenges, especially if it's sulfuric or some other type where we might get some reactions. Right. Um, Dr. Shaw, with the facilities you, you monitored as well as Dr. Anderson, um, they were mechanically ventilated. Um, many times swine facilities or, or other facilities are, have side curtains lowered um, and these are large outlets for emissions. So how, is your, how are these systems applicable to uh, curtain-sided barns? I'll let Dr. Anderson take the first crack and then I'll follow up. All right, well, uh, I think from my perspective, using that uh, trickling wet scrubber system on a curtain-sided barn doesn't seem very feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, the electrostatic ionization system, you could see potential ways to deploy it. Um, but again, that would be a lot larger area and a more costly installation rather than just at the end of the tunnel of barns, right, and directed at those fans. And you might have some concerns about what that would do for wind flow patterns going into your barn. So. Uh, both of these technologies, one of the reasons that the producers were able to look at them is, you know, for the electrostatic ionization. They went to a tunnel ventilated barn and they thought while they were doing that, this was something they could add on. Uh, with, with the uh, trickling wet scrubber system, again, they had some ideas about how they wanted to ventilate their barn. They had went fully mechanical and they thought that gave them more opportunity for odor control. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why they, they actually picked those styles rather than a naturally ventilated barn. Let me just add to a little bit, uh, uh, add a little bit to what Dan just said. Um, in North Carolina, uh, most of our finishing barns, uh, we have some finishing barns that are nat naturally ventilated, and we also have some turkey grower barns that are naturally ventilated, mm -hmm. uh, but they are few. I mean, they do have uh, mixing fans inside. They do have uh, misters or drippers inside. Um, on cross ventilated uh, barns where you have exhaust ventilation, where you actually pull air out of the system, you could use this system. It wouldn't be as, uh, up, as problematic, but if you have a cross ventilated barn where you have positive pressure system, where you're pushing air inside, I would hate to actually put obstructions on the uh, outlet or the exhaust uh, outlet side. Um, so for naturally ventilated barns, I, I think that your vegetative environmental buffers are probably a better um, option, uh, are definitely a better option. I don't think this system would work in a naturally ventilated barn. But yes, in um, uh, tunnel ventilated barns, I mean, this, uh, our system is uh, modular and it's, it's easy, it's at least on the swine side. Right. A uh, question for both of you. If dust collects on the fence, and as you mentioned, is periodically washed by the rain um, into the, onto the ground below, what is the potential for that dust or any odor or gases attached to those particles to be regenerated after drying? Do you have a, a feel for that or a theory or, or measurements to support that? Um, uh, let me add a little bit. Obviously, what we can do is 
obviously if you have uh, the dust collecting on the ground then you will have some of it uh, um, re-entrained into the system and it would definitely con uh, contribute to odors but mm -hmm. it can also happen that if you have rain or if the soil is relatively moist you can have some of the constituents move into the ground now that may result in reduced uh, odor problems or concerns mm -hmm. especially with the nitrogen species and it may also happen with the sulfur species um, but yes re-entrainment is definitely um, something that can happen but it will depend on how much rain you have and what kind of antecedent soil moisture conditions you have it is possible that if you have an area um, in front of uh, let's say if i talk about my system uh, you might put down a little bit of compost if you put down a little bit of compost over there as we did at the swine farm uh, you provide uh, a reservoir for uh, the microbes to start doing their stuff mm -hmm. Only that they, they do need to have reasonable moisture contents to be able to be active. Dan, anything to add to that question? That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, you know, visually, we didn't see much of that dust accumulating on the ground below our electrostatic precipitation system. Uh, we had a rock base and it, most of that dust, when it would rain, washed down into that rock base and I couldn't see it. It doesn't mean it wasn't re-releasing odors, but uh, mm -hmm. it was out of sight, so I, I didn't give it much mind. Okay. There's another question that came through in the chat. Um, did, um, as these filter walls became clogged or filled with dust, did you do flow measurements to, to make sure that air was still being moved, air still was moving through these walls, even as dust accumulated on them? Was that for Dan or for me? Both of you. Okay. Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Shaw, though. Um, in my case, yes, we did uh, uh, do flow measurements at different porosity conditions. But again, as I said in my presentation earlier, what happens is if you have dust accumulation in the front, then the air starts finding its way out through the sides and at the, uh, through the top. And so the uh, static pressure inside the barn never increased, inside that enclosure never increased above 0 0.05 inches of static pressure. And that is what I found most encouraging. So obviously, just like water finds its easiest way out, air also did that. If it, go, if it couldn't go out through the front, it would go out through the sides and at the top, which was also screened. I didn't take any airflow measurements, but it was rare for us to go more than a week and a half or two weeks without a rainfall event that washed off our fence. Okay, so very regional, probably a regional specific yes. answer for that too. Yes. Uh, could um, each of you give a very quick, um, very quick explanation of the odor measurement? Because you used a couple different techniques for odor measurement. I mean, particularly the olfactometry lab analysis or the force choice, um, and then the nasal ranger. Uh, there was a question about the olfactom olfactory lab analysis, um, whether the airstream is filtered prior to presenting the system to panelists and, and does that impact the effect of dust in that order measurement? Yes, Our, so with the olfactometry, uh, what we did is we had a Tedlar bag. We had a pre-filter as we'd collect that Tedlar bag under vacuum. It was collected over a five minute cumulative time sample, um, but it was filtered, right? So mm -hmm. dust would not be in that sample. Uh, when we bring it back to the olfactometer and actually install that sample, again, there's a, a pre-filter to make sure that it, there is no dust presented to the, the panelist. So it is a dust, dust-free measurement or approximately a dust-free measurement. Um, they smell that sample and two blanks and they have to identify which of the samples had an odorant. Uh, and our point of detection was when they could identify that the odor sample correctly twice in a row, uh, which, which one of the three samples actually had the odorant. In our case, we used a field method that uh, Nasal Ranger, obviously the company St. Croix is in Minnesota. So you might be aware of that instrument as well. What we did, as I said earlier, earlier was we would go in earlier, uh, very early in the morning when ambient winds were relative, were non-existent and the air was quite heavy. And I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of dust, but uh, when you sample with the nasal ranger, you have an opening that that can allow dust to come in. And so I cannot say that we 
excluded all of the dust, but um, the contribution of uh, um, uh, uh, dust, uh, the order attached to the dust might be quite low. Uh, a couple of, uh, another question for you, Dr. Shaw, what would be the likely decrease in dilution to threshold at 10 meters just from natural dilution effects? Uh, well, um, that's a very good question, but realize that our measurements were made in front of the control fans and then in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. So we did normalize for that. How much of dilution would you have uh, if you had the screen versus not having the screen? So we, uh, that would be a factor. Uh, but um, obviously, um, uh, I don't have a much better answer to that, but we tried to normalize for that. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, with that, I have two more quick questions uh, while you're taking time to answer this. Uh, Dr. Shaw, can you um, define to TSP? Total suspended particulates. I apologize if I did not uh, do that more often. So total suspended particulates would be everything. It would include PM10 as well as the larger fractions. And with the sampler that we had, uh, the optical sampler that we had, it did not have a cutoff head. So it did not, it was not size selective. It could pull in everything. Uh, uh, it, it, it would measure everything that passed through it. Okay. And VOCs, uh, either one of you. Volatile organic compounds. So these would be a mixture of uh, organic um, gases, would be, which could be alcohols, it could be aldehydes. Et cetera, et cetera, reduce sulfur gases. And uh, we did not, we were unable to measure those. Uh, we just measured a couple of really strange ones in our GC MS. Uh, so that's all I can say about that. Dan ha probably has more, uh, had much more success with that VOC measurements. I didn't put any in my presentation. I do have some data on it. And at certain times we had more success with it. At certain <laughs> times it gave us some trouble too, but uh, we would, we'll hopefully have some results summarized on it. But I do wanna thank Dr. Anderson and Dr. Shaw for sharing the information on these options for cleaning uh, barn exhaust air. Again, the more options we have to add to the discussion and to this decision process, we recognize there's a lot of management considerations, cost considerations and effectiveness considerations. Uh, for these different systems. So having options is really important.